resilient roads need resilient materials. And so for the purpose of this morning, I'm going to go for the public's favourite, which is asphalt. You may have seen Transport Focus in the main hall early on today reveal that the public actually don't want concrete roads. I don't think there's anything wrong with concrete roads, but for the purpose of today, I'll focus on asphalt materials, if that's OK. So look forward or look back. There's been a number of moves of late to reintroduce hot rolled asphalt as a surface course. I'm not so sure that's a prime example of looking forward as the random scattering of aggregate on a newly laid surface to produce a supposedly safe and skid resistant surface is probably not something that's particularly future proof in my view. There has been a great wealth in understanding of our material behaviour in terms of the ingredients of asphalt, but we don't seem to consider them when we're writing our specifications. So I think one of the problems that we may face is an inappropriate or a lack of an appropriate database to collate all the performance criteria of the materials so that when we put them on the highway we can actually measure what they're actually doing as a contribution to the durability of the pavement. When we talk about supply chain security there are a number of things that we might want to consider. I believe we have enough aggregates. I don't think that aggregate shortages are an issue for us at all, even at the higher PSV end of the scale. I think we need to find better ways of husbanding those resources, and uh, we certainly have enough, and we can import them. There are a great number of deposits with an easy reach uh, of the United Kingdom where they're readily available. So, we don't want concrete, we've got plenty of stone. What do we need? The real change is almost certainly going to come from bitumen and I shall be talking about what's happening in the world of bitumen. And if you think it's warm enough in here and you're ready for a sleep, just you wait. <laughs> if we want to talk about performance or compliance as imposed specifications, are we doing the right thing by having imposed recipes? If you want something to be durable and we want a durable pavement, why are we specifying the mixtures ingredient by ingredient and by percentage to actually put them in there. Why don't we look at the performance of the road? I would suggest that's a better way to build in durability and measure durability. State of the asset. Uh, existing data is, is, is obviously retrospective, but all it does is give you, I say all it does, it does quite a bit, but what it does give you is a view of how the pavement has failed. And it can give you an indication of the residual life of the pavement. So you know the when and you know the how, but you don't know why it failed. There's a great lack of information in examining why materials fail. And, and, and for example, you know, lots of people have looked at thin surfacing failures and said, this is a bad thing. I'm not aware of any significant study done on SMA that's been laid successfully and why it is different from the stuff that's failed. So I think, again, we're possibly pursuing the wrong parameters of the highway. I'll also chat a bit about circular economy and we'll have a look at some, some next steps as well. Aggregates. I say we have enough, uh, but I don't know if you know, but when you quarry uh, a tonne of stone, you actually get round about 35% combined per tonne of 10 millimeter and 40 millimeter aggregate. Now that's a very low yield from virgin materials that we're trying to husband. And um, I believe we should be doing something, particularly with the higher PSVs, but with the sizes either side of the 10 and 40. I'm not suggesting get rid of them, but we need to look at some other aspects of that because there are various ways of using the materials. On the continent, there's a great deal of eight millimeter used for a variety of reasons. And there are lots of papers that uh, most of you will know about the skid resistance in relation to the nominal size of the asphalt you put down. There's plenty of evidence to show the smaller you go, the, actually, the better it gets. So I think we need to explore those things. But I do believe, as I said, uh, that there's plenty of aggregate about. But bitumen, enough of what? I can see you all lighting on the IMO regulations 2020 and thinking, yeah, I really want to know about that. But you probably do. Uh, diesel fuel you're all aware of is going to be phased out. Diesel fuel actually comes uh, in the main from the lower distillates uh, within a refinery, as does what's called HFO, which is heavy fuel oil. Heavy fuel oil, which is sold for ships and many other uses, contains about 3.5% sulfur. 
IMO is the International Marine Organization, and by 2020, high fuel oil, sulfur containing, will be banned for use in uh, combustion in ships and many other combustion uh, systems, such as heating, etc. Now, why is that significant? Well, it's a very, very large volume market for the refiners. And what they're doing is altering the way that they refine not to make this material. They have uses for the sulfur. The sulfur will go back into agriculture. And there are other things that you can do with sulfur, manufacture of sulfuric acid and all those sorts of things. So having taken the sulfur out is not an issue to them. They left it in because they were selling the product. Now they can't sell the product. They need to refine the sulfur out. And refining that out, they're going to alter significantly the nature of the bitumen that's available for us to use in asphalt manufacture. I believe that this is not necessarily a threat. I actually think it may well give us an opportunity to do something about designing our bitumens to give us the durability characteristics that we're looking for. If you want to know where the refining capacity is going, in Europe in the last six years, two million barrels per day of refining capacity has closed. And the reason it closed is because a lot of the refineries of an age that cannot withstand the investment necessary to put what are called cokers on the back end of the refineries to boil up the last residue to get all the goodies out of it. And a coker, Exxon fitted one, Exxon Mobil fitted one in Antwerp about 18 months ago, uh, 1.4 billion, billion US dollars to actually build it. Uh, they used to supply us, FM Combo, with 100,000 tons of bitumen a year, now none, because they don't make any. They don't make any at all. In fact, they pretty much pulled out of the UK market in terms of bitumen supplies. They're making jet fuel. Jet fuel is the future in terms of refining. Oh, and gas. Shell actually dealing more gas than they do oil now, which is a matter of interest. The whole face of oil refining and hydrocarbon fuels is changing, and we need to be aware of that. The new generation refineries produce what's called a, ref, uh, a residue bitumen, which is what's left at the bottom. Um, and that has had some of the goodness boiled out of it, as it were. I'll show you some complicated slides in a minute that I'll pretend to explain to you. I don't understand them either, but you'll be impressed by what they contain. Uh, but when we're talking about having predictable performance for asphalts, we need to know what we're putting in in terms of the binder. So we need to add things back to those binders, to those bitumen, to actually give us the roads that we want. Let's just move on a bit. Right, does it matter? Am I talking complete and utter nonsense? Well, if you look at that graph there, that's a, uh, a trial that was done uh, in the Netherlands, and that actually tested uh, five sources of bitumen uh, that we would use tomorrow. You, ca you can't actually see it, but there's a scale difference um, uh, in that, and you can see that the, the differences in magnitude is some three times from the best to the worst in that. So when you're buying something, a bitumen, it's specified by two physical properties. Penetration and softening point. I won't go into them, but they're very, very simple things. There are 1,200 hydrocarbons minimum that make up bitumen. There are round about 2,500 sources of crude oil that are regularly used in European refineries. Only 300 of those sources are suitable for making bitumen in the first place. So that's why you're getting this variation here. So when we're doing our retrospective data and we're wondering, well, it's failed because it's been surfacing. Well, it might be that you've actually got one of the ones at the bottom end of that. I don't know that you have. But what I'm saying is we don't understand these parameters and we don't examine them with enough or we don't give them enough scrutiny to make use of them. To know what's in it, and, and you'll love this, but it's a bit like a shampoo advert, isn't it? This is the science bit now. This is really, really good. The only bit you need to look at is where it says uh, naphtha naphthenic aromatics, up there, naphthene aromatics. Bitumen contains what's called the SARA, which is the saturates, the aromatics, the resins, and the asphaltines. And SARA analysis is a routine chemical assessment of what bitumen and crude oil contains. But the graph below and the squeezing of those naphthene aromatics is what happens to the bitumen as it ages. Don't worry about the units, just accept that the aromatics, which because they are aromatics means they're volatile, it means they evaporate, and they are disappearing over time. Interestingly enough, those are the ones that the oil boys want to sell you under the guises of many other things. So they're the things they're taking out as well. So we may end up with something which doesn't start off with that 
aromatic in there unless we add it back in but we'll certainly end up with a hell of a lot less as it ages and it oxidizes and it gets more acidic as it gets more acidic it can actually repel some aggregate so the durability of the road which comes from the bond between bitumen and aggregate can change because we're making the bitumen more acidic as it gets harder does that mean that uh, everything's going to be worse in the future well uh, I, I don't think it is um, I think that in actual fact we can predict performance of what we've got so we can actually make these things uh, there we go it's taking a long time durable asphalt uh, again it's a very simple graph we actually want to know where we are in the critical range and that's just before it cracks when it's cracked it's too late it's, it's the retrospective data again we need to understand where we're going and and, and how do we get to that well and, you know, i knew you'd love this one uh, this is this is a, an example of what's called a glover row parameter graph and um the PAV that you can see on there stands for pressurized aging vessel. So what we do, that's a fancy name for a pressure cooker. Take a core out in the road, chuck it in a pressure cooker, boil it up and see what happens. Uh, and if you do enough of them, you can actually establish a very, very good relationship. And cracking, the reduction of cracking, the prediction of cracking, the modeling of cracking is what we need for a durable road. Ignore the surface course. I saw a, a, a survey done by an asset management company, software company, so I'm not, you know, all they do is collect the numbers, they don't do anything else like that. And they said that on the surface course, they got rut depths of 35 millimetres. Well, they only lay it 40 mil thick, so I would suggest it's the layer below that's rotting, not the surface course. So again, let's, let, let's understand what we're trying to measure and what we're trying to look at here. What we need to do is to get the fatigue cracking in the lower layers of the road sorted out. I don't suppose you were aware that the specification for highways works, which is the Bible in the United Kingdom, has no mention of fatigue resistance in it at all. It's not specified. It tells you how many lumps of this and how many lumps of that you should put together and how much bitumen you used to glue them together, but it doesn't tell you that it has to resist fatigue. I would suggest for a durable road that perhaps we ought to be looking at that too, and therefore performance specification is something we should consider. Anyway, we'll move on. One of the problems of predictive modeling is that when you make something in the laboratory, it doesn't work on the road. And the reason it doesn't work on the road is because we have very nice stainless steel pressure cookers and we boil things up and we do all sorts of things with them. And then we give it to the asphalt manufacturers of which I won. And we're a far less sophisticated breed. We tend to eat our food raw, so we've never seen a pressure cooker. So we take the bitumen, which has been carefully refined and engineered, and then, lo and behold, we check it through an asphalt plant at over 200 degrees centigrade and check aggregates at 250 degrees centigrade on it. The thermal shock to the whole elasticity of the material is quite significant. So trying to link lab to field is very, very important. That's why the, uh, uh, this project that's shown by the logos in the corner, University of New Hampshire in the United States, Nottingham University, FM Conway, my company, and Driven Consultancy started to look at the parameters that you could actually measure in the laboratory that could be reproduced in the road. And I won't go through the parameters, but what we did was uh, we actually used short-term oven aging, which is the STOA uh, uh, up there. We took a very common material, we made some on site, we reheated it, we made some in the laboratory, we did all sorts, and we identified three main characteristics and if you look at the pictures down there the pictures are pretty similar that's all you need to know and that actually demonstrates a pictorial fact that we can predict in the laboratory certain parts of the laid performance and we did that on uh, circular economy recycling is it an old chestnut or is it a missed opportunity According to EARPA, the European Asphalt Pavement Association, the UK recycles 3.5 million tonnes of asphalt a year, but it produces 20 million tonnes, which says over 80% actually goes into virgin construction. I suggest, gentlemen, that's not the case. I think the 3.5 is a tad light, so there is an opportunity there. But even if we accept that the 3.5 is, is the number, what we don't do is we actually don't ensure that we put the recycle back to the highest value place in that, within the recycling. We need to know the provenance of this material. It's not second hand and therefore cheap. This is a material that should be valued. Bear in mind this contains good old bitumen that used to have some good stuff in it. Not this new rubbish that you're gonna be buying in five years time. This is the good stuff. You wanna be keeping this, I would suggest. So you need to quality assure the recycle that you're getting. 
and that involves having time and space to do it properly. What we do is we call the road. We look at the petrology of the rock that we're getting out of there, and we actually segregate it. We have skim planed 35 millimeter off a 65 plus PSV road and recycled 50% of that back into a clause 942 type material and put that back on the A1. Now, according to the SHW, you can only put 10% in. So a, a, a big shout out for TFL who had the guts to say, let's go and do this and do it. Unfortunately, when you process the 10 millimeter out to make a clause 942, you get the same sort of yield as you do from a quarry stand. So you've got a whole load of side product of high PSV on that. So we said to TFL, this is not economically sensible for you guys to do this. We'll make you an asphaltic concrete with the other stuff that comes out at the same time. So we chuck that down on the A40 and, and all of the scrim and all of the tests that we've done so far um, are showing that it's behaving like a standard virgin material. So you can recycle to the highest value, and that's how you can husband and conserve the PSV that you've got. Recycle the recycle. If you only recycle once, all you're doing is deferring the cost. You're actually not avoiding the cost at all. You've got to be able to recycle and recycle and recycle again. A PhD student did a paper, recycling and recycling, and he was accelerated aging the product, and he got to an effective life of 70 years out of the same sample of bitumen before he decided actually he'd done enough and he didn't take it any further. Obviously you need to add things back into that because the aromatics are coming off, you need to put virgin bitumen back in there, you need to put other additives, polymer, polymer modifiers, uh, what are called rejuvenating agents, though that's a, an entirely different debate. But we need to make sure the recycle is durable for hot mix and for warm mix and for cold mix. Cold mix is relatively straightforward because there are specific applications for that, but for hot mix and warm mix, we need to do that. And I come back to the contention that performance or prescription, if we start specifying what we want, we'll stand a far better chance of it lasting for the time that we expect it to, rather than laying it down and hoping that we've made the cake the right way. We need to design for warmer and wetter environment. Uh, the University of New Hampshire are looking at climate change very seriously because they're going to have very high temperature events as well as rain. We're going to get rain. And therefore, the bond between the aggregate and the bitumen is of great, great significance. Uh, there are various ways of doing that, um, but we need to thicken the binder film whilst retaining skid resistance and maintaining the road profile. We have the answers to this, but we need to ask ourselves the questions in the first instance, and I don't think we're doing so. Laboratory versus field we've talked about asset management data collection. There is technology out there now which will actually link your asphalt plants to the paver and to the compaction equipment which will give you a digital as-built drawing. I suggest that we start to accommodate that and come up with some common data platforms on this so that we can swap information with each other to get the best possible model. The inverse around new materials and new techniques, I, I, I don't think they are new particularly, I, um, I just don't think we've actually tried them sufficiently to understand the benefits that they can offer us. Customer and client requirements are changing, the emphasis on the budget, on the need to spend on societal issues will always mean that highways is going to be a cheap target for these things. So we need to address these things, but we need to understand what we're doing with our technology to get the best value out of it. And whilst we're waiting for that, don't worry about the bitumen because they're actually going to make it out of lignin. Now, lignin uh, it comes in a couple of forms. It's a byproduct of bulk paper, uh, paper bulk uh, production. It's a lignosulfonate. And that, uh, it's already used already to stick various things together, but uh, there's some evidence that we might be able to stick roads together with it. And uh, lignin works as well. And lignite, which is an inferior coal, by the way, which is uh, all over the place, especially in Europe, uh, it's a hydrocarbon, but you can actually use that to stick things together with, and that works quite well, in actual fact. Um, so we may well end up, you know, with non-petroleum-based renewables and streets that are paved with an algae. Um, before we get to that point, we need to look at some of the other stuff I said. Before.